Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up today with a special selection which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. Today's special selection comes at us from Mark. I discovered Azure as one of the bands featured on YouTube channel Prog Rock Doc when they did a multi-hour feature presenting albums from their community bands such as Rogue Frequency, Azure, Bastion Purr, and Android Superstation. Azure blew me away and I was instantly a super fan. Azure creates musical storytelling in the shape of songs, they push boundaries, and have virtuosity in every area. For this, the album The Songs Come From was nominated Prog Magazine's Reader's Unsigned Album of the Year. These songs form important parts of a story, later released in Path of the Edsdenist, Lou, which is a great read, and their more recent songs continue the novel themes even more creatively. I hope you enjoy. So, let's dive into this then. We're going to be looking at two tracks, uh, Amiotoko 1 and Amiotoko 2. The first movement is called The Curse, and the second movement is called Cloudburst. That's pretty cool. Alright, let's dive into this first one. We will be taking a break between the two movements to discuss uh, the first part before moving into the second. Let's dive in. Bright, confident, but adventurous. Something still to be learned, filled in. That was a nice little seven idea. Is that what that was? Yep. Harmony, dig it. Very nice bass tone, large and resonant. Oh, the uh, piano line just shifted back. Maybe it sounds plucked. The slight bend on the electric guitar. Very cool micro adjustments. Interesting how empty this feels without the uh, guitar bends on top of everything. It's such a subtle aspect of the last atmosphere, and yet it's totally felt here when they're not present. Beautiful melodic phrasing. Very musical theater. The crescendo of the guitar into the panning of the guitar. That 
Chum. Even the subtle movement climbing up the uh, notes. Yeah, a lot of tension on that. No resolution to this at all. It's not cyclical either, it just continues to increase in tension before resetting back to the beginning. The almost uh, out of tune, detuned synth stuff that was going on on the left side too. Somewhere along the lines, we shifted to 4 4. Not sure when that happens. Then one night, the mistress comes. God sets the price of my curse. Oh! Ooh. Funkiness back. Oh, on the base. It's just such a, a bright, open harmonic element to this song. It's so expressive. In its positivity. It almost has a little bit of uh, like 80s synth pop influence to it, which is a very cool, very cool component. There's a lot of rhythmic interplay where multiple instruments will share rhythmic accents. There's a lot of movement outside of that, that ba ba ba. Everybody shares in that. That's very cool. Interesting, given that snare on 6 and 7. Yeah, 2, 4, 6, 7. Interesting. It's very victorious and powering chorus. Dang, that falsetto is clean.
Yeah, that was uh, interesting. The rhythm I was picking up there at the end, we only just got past the beat of 8. We never got a full beat in before it changed again. So that'd be like 15, 16. Well, uh, 15, 8 maybe? I don't know. It's like... Well, lucky me. Lucky me, I got... Uh... I have some tabs I can look at for this one, and I'll uh, check that out later. See how it ends, because I, I caught on to most of the metric changes. I know the four happened somewhere I didn't pick up on, but uh, you know, I, I counted the seven at the beginning. I picked up on the four somewhere in that area. I picked up when we returned back to the seven. Um, and as far as I could tell, there weren't any other places that really threw me off. So either um, any metric changes were invisible in that the rhythmic pulses didn't really allude to any oddity of pulse or they, they just didn't happen. We only stuck with that seven and the four. So it was really interesting there at the end for me to get thrown off a little bit like that. But yeah, it's like eight and a quarter, maybe. No, not eight and a quarter. Because we don't get the full eight. Yeah, so it'd be like... Yeah, it's got to be like 15 then, right? I don't know. I'll check it out later. It is a, it is a very groovy song, though. Almost every section, regardless of if it is an irregular time signature, like a 7-4, or if it's in a more standard one, like 4-4... Four, four, it's it's got a good groove to it and you don't really feel the oddity of the time too often um i think the only time it really showed up is the intro and when we revisited this intro lick uh, when it's very clearly a grouping of four and then a grouping of three and so that second group you kind of feel like you lurch forward a little bit you're expecting four beats again and you get one less you're thrust into that next bar before you're ready for it I think that's the only time that it really feels a little out of place, but, well, not out of place, or it feels, uh, where, the, where the temporal asymmetry is felt. Um, but every other place that we had an, an odd time signature, specifically more of that seven, there seemed to be a groove that helped uh, with the fluidity of that. Even when we had the uh, snare accents on two, four, six, and eight, um, although I think at one point we had the and of two and then six and eight. There was still enough of a groove to what the drums were presenting there to not really feel the uh, uh, asymmetry of the time signature. And a great way of covering up having that seven beats per phrase uh, in a way that uh, you can groove to. You can move your body to and not feel disjointed or, or thrown about in any way rhythmically. They do a great job of that, of incorporating the uh, the stranger time signatures with uh, elements of groove and flow. But I don't think that metric elements is really what stands out to me here. I think it's the easy thing to talk about. But what stands out to me most here is an expansive harmonic palette. And I don't mean that the harmonic palette itself is large. I think they primarily work within one or two main emotions within this song. But those emotions are very large. They're very freeing. They're very uh, open-ended. And a lot of this, to me, is a song about potential. That's what I get out of this song. It's, it's very freeing. A lot of it feels like flight. Especially, I mean, I could even hear some of these chord progressions and melodies underneath, uh, you know, a film scene of somebody flying for the first time, whether it's, you know, them building a jetpack, they're an inventor or something, or they just developed magic powers and now they can fly. It's, it's that freedom that you get from that flight that is baked into almost every moment of this song. And I, I didn't even realize this, but even some of the melodic lines with their massive jumps. I mean, the melodies here very rarely sit within, you know, two or three notes and just kind of hover around a home note, going a, a little above, a little below, creating something that's easy to remember. 
Instead, they go the other way and go for high dramatics, uh, going for a very theatric approach to it with large jumps between notes and having a very wide range in each particular section. Even the verse, which is a bit more limited in range than the chorus is, still has quite a, a an expansive gap between its highest and lowest notes. These aren't designed to be earworms, to be super catchy. They're designed to be like, as far as I'm concerned, kind of like candy. It is so sweet and, and addicting to listen to fantastic melody lines like this. And they're all just so bright and cheery. There isn't really a lot of dissonance or tension in any of the vocal work. Even the song as a whole primarily works with consonant and brighter sounds. But all of that, I think, lends itself well to the over... Well, I just looked at the title of the song, and it's called The Curse. <laughs> That's kind of the opposite of all of the emotional components I'm getting from the song's harmonic area. Um... This, to me, is very much a song about freedom, of about gaining something that embellishes life, that makes it better. Um, and I was going to lead into the chorus here with those big runs, kind of have, you know, the runs up and then maybe a little down, coming back up, a little down, and then the really big leap into those higher tones, and especially the second time through this chorus, going into that really strong falsetto. These are empowering melodies. They feel strong. They feel free. They feel adventurous. They're just bright and happy. You know, in a sense, it's almost anthemic, but not in a not like a arena rock anthem kind of way, or, or like like a pop rock anthem. Um, but in something that just feels very victorious for the vocalist and or possibly the, the character, whatever, you know, the story is about. It's about, it's about being open to doing whatever you want. And doing that, both harmonically having that freedom and openness in the sound, but also melodically having these massive leaps um, and doing these wild uh feats of, of vocalization i mean i don't want to downplay this at all uh, i hope i don't but <laughs> some of those vocal jumps were insane honestly like this is stuff you need to know you're going to stick the landing on because you have one shot to hit that note up there perfect you got to be dead on with your with your tuning of it and you have to come in with such strength behind it. You can't you can't fade into it. You can't lean or slide into it. It has to be hit dead on. And you're talking about octave and a half jump. I think a two octave jump on that biggest one. I mean, you just have to know. Your muscles have to know what they need to do and just do it. And that is not something anybody can just pull off. It is phenomenal. It's about knowing you have this skill and having you know, the freedom to, to engage with it from a, even from a performative angle, this feels like freedom to me outside of anything musical. It's absolutely bonkers. Uh, and the song starts off with that open adventurous freedom and it never lets go of it for the most part. Uh, some sections I think are more adventurous, some sections are more open, some sections are more carefree, but it all sort of ties together into this general idea of I can do what I want, and I will because I can. And, uh, you know, I want to go do some stuff, so I'm going to go do them. And I love that that open feeling. You don't really get that too much. Um, you know, when I think of uh, bands that this reminds me of, um, I think the first things that come to mind are, are Haken and Frost. And, well, Haken more, I think, on the production side, but Frost harmonically. But I think even with their work, it doesn't quite push to these extremes uh, in the brightness and, and uh, open elements. This really is very unique. In the world of prog rock and uh, I kind of dig it for that 
Now the harmony and melody isn't the only thing that stands out here. We also have the bass guitar, which I absolutely love. Very nice resonant tone. Um, kind of reminds me of older prog rock bass production. Especially since the bass does a lot of functional and foundational ideas here. So the production puts it front and center. We have our plucked string. I still don't know what that is. It kind of sounds like a harp to me, but it also might have been like a clean electric guitar. I, I don't know. That's over here. We have our electric guitar over here. We have vocals, drum center, but we also have the bass center. And it, it sits at the bottom of the song doing these bassier tones. Um, but it also has plenty of spotlight too. There's nothing it's contending with pitch-wise in the center uh, channel other than the vocals, which are way above it in pitch. You're not really going to have any uh, crossover with those two sounds. Um, and so it's very clear to always hear what the bass is doing. It frequently pairs with the bass kick rhythmically. Note-wise, sometimes you do get some pedal tone, but often enough we get walking bass lines. Uh, nothing that I think really takes center stage as far as being a, a lead lead melody in any way. I think the bassist has chops for it, but the song simply doesn't ask it. It doesn't need it. It's quite possible we'll see something like that in part two. But I, I like the restraint here. Hopefully it's restraint uh, and not a lack of composition for the bass. Uh, but in another way, the bass also does what it does in uh, a lot of jazzy uh, groups too, is that it sort of leads the band. It is that foundation element. Maybe it doesn't need to be lead because it's the glue that holds everything together. It has its own very important role for everything. So I, I, I want to keep that in mind moving forward too, as to not be too negative on the bass composition. I, I do like to hear melody on the bass. I think the bass is just a beautiful instrument and it should play melody more often. And I try not to take that out specifically on any bands or songs, <laughs> even if it's something that I, I think we just don't see enough of. Uh, but the bass sounds great. The drums have some cool flow in them. Uh, there's some nice uh, drum fills at times, but for the most part, the drummer is, much like the bass, very functional, very foundational, presenting a melody, sorry, presenting the rhythm and uh, the rhythmic pulse, more importantly, acting as a bit of a human metronome. We do have some cool accent rhythms that we have in here, such as I mentioned there at the end in that seven, that we had the and of two and then the six, seven, and then that eventually shifted to two, four, six, seven which kind of changed some of the syncopated attack at the beginning of the phrase and gave it more of a, this rigidity with a bit of a, an additional pulse there at the end to give it some more energy moving into the repetition. There are neat moments like that where the drummer gets to expand on some stuff. But for the most part, just like the bass, it's there to be part of the rhythm section to present the foundation and groove for the song, for everything else to be expanded and performed on top of. And... I mean, that's where everything, to me, this is where the song excels, is everything outside of the rhythm section. We do have three melodic instruments here. I've already praised the vocals enough, I think, um, and that's where we get the other two instruments, the electric guitar and maybe the electric guitar, maybe a harp of some sort. I don't know. <laughs> um... I kind of, I wish I knew what that instrument was. I might look that up. When I do the lyrics, I might see if I can find a little bit of that information so I can stop saying that thing over there. Um, but that thing over there kicks the song off. Uh, it introduces the opening idea, which is constant eighth notes. It's a beautiful melody. There's no really home note to it. I think if we took all the notes present... We could probably find something in the middle and call that a home note, but there's nothing that we return to too often. It is a, a lick, an ostinato, a cyclical concept, a riff, if you will. So it does cycle back in on itself, but there's a lot of melodic movement to it as well. And being that we are in a seven beat bar here, it is a bit longer. It's almost a two bar phrase in a typical 4-4 song. Um, 
but there's no pedal tone to this. There's no note that we continue to return to. It feels very open and expressive, which is a good way of introducing the song because harmonically we're going to be moving in that direction as well. The idea, though, also is that it does loop in upon itself. So there is a type of constraint here that we don't see in other melodies throughout almost as if we're talking about being caged at the beginning of the song and then it opens up and we have this freedom maybe i'm reading into it but i kind of see that that could be something going on here and that would be something that i would probably look for on a second listen um but we have these beautiful, I almost want to call them ornamental ideas because they are ostinatos, they are these shorter concepts, and because they typically add a type of uh, glistening or, or shimmering side to the song, both in the timbre, the sound of the instrument, but also the fact that this instrument constantly and usually plays faster moving melodic ideas, constantly, you know, rising and lowering in pitch, not huge jumps like the vocals tend to make, but smaller ideas, usually rising and falling patterns. It feels not so much as a melody in that I would call it counter melody to the vocals, but in a way of augmenting the melody that's already present. Ornamental ideas. It adds color and flavor and, and pretty stuff <laughs> to the melody that's front and center in the spotlight. But we do have counterpoint from the guitar off to the side. And what I think is really interesting is that while we do see a bit of counterpoint in how it plays against and around what the vocals are playing, there's also that moment where we spotlight the electric guitar. This was interesting because of the movement of it. It kind of shred for a while. I don't remember if they were 8th notes or 16th notes. But just a lot of fast moving playing. Kind of brought in the sound of that instrument. <laughs> The one I don't know, um, and how it typically plays throughout this, but there is what I felt to be a little bit more melodic movement to it. It wasn't just a short cycle, it was longer and expressive, a little bit more linear, but it was about movement. I don't think that what they were playing was quite as important as what it did sonically. And I think this is really the only place I'm going to talk about the production of this. Well, I have one more other production note. Uh, but it, it crescendos in, rises in volume off on the side, and then starts panning around. I thought this was kind of cool. I, I don't know exactly what it was supposed to mean. And I don't know that it was a perfect idea. I did find it to be a bit distracting, at least on my first time listen. I paid attention more to the movement than to the notes themselves, and maybe that's how they wanted it. The narrative storytelling of the production of it, more so than the narrative storytelling of the music of it. But I think it's the only thing in the entire song that had any movement like this. We did have the fade in or the crescendo at the beginning of the song with that first instrument. But other than that, we don't really have a lot of crescendos. We don't have a lot of panning in here. Everything's rather stationary. We don't have a lot of dynamic components. And the song, even uh, emotionally, is, isn't really dynamic either. It's sort of varying elements of like running an 8 to a 10 of, of free and joyful and carefree. Some are a little less, some are a little more, but we don't really dip the song down in any way. We don't bring the intensity or energy down, really. Uh, I think there's one moment where we kind of bring it down for like four bars, maybe, just to create big contrast to return back to where we were. It's not a song that's too interested in contrast at all. Um, and that's for better or worse. I think generally I enjoyed this song as a whole like i said a lot of it just feels like candy to me it's a very sweet song that sounds fantastic there's so many cool harmonic and melodic ideas in it it's just a treat to listen to but if you're not in the mood for this very optimistic music it doesn't really offer anything else not even in minutia there is i mean we like i said there's one moment in the song where we kind of dip into dissonance and tension 
Uh, and I mentioned that harmonically we had the tension, it was just rising tension with no resolution. We just start back at the first layer of tension. Um, and then there were some dissonant notes that came from one of the instruments. I don't remember what that was. But that was rather short, like 20 seconds out of the 9 minute song. And everything else is positive. Um, so it, it does what it does very well and doesn't really deviate from that much at all. I will say, though, on the topic of production, the, the one criticism I have for this song, other than it being very uh, one note in, in a sense, and maybe it's supposed to be, you know, maybe this song is just about this single emotion in which being one dimensional musically works very well with the, um, the intentions of what they wanted out of the song. But the vocal production is... I think a little off. It's a little too forward into the mix and sometimes feels distant from the band. On the one hand, this might be intentional. The side instruments feel very distant from the center channel too. This is a very wide, expansive sound sphere with not a lot of instrumentation to go in there to fill that space. It can feel a little empty at times, just that there's a lot of space between the instruments. This might be intentional. This concept of space works well with freedom. You're not contained at all. The song is open. There's lots of place to move around. Instruments can even come in from a little bit of their, their placement. For instance, uh, you know, the right guitar could come in closer to the center and there would still be plenty of space. There wouldn't be any sonic overlap. Um, and there would be plenty of space for all the instruments to still be heard clearly without stepping on anyone's toes or anything like that. Even in the center channel, the vocals are so high in pitch, the bass is so low in pitch, there's no overlap at all. They're barely touching, they're barely in the same room, despite being in the same channel. It's just a very spacious production. Uh, and so maybe the vocals being so far in front of the band is supposed to be like that. But I do think kind of bringing the volume down a little bit would bring it more in line and mix it uh, in a little bit with the rest of the group a little bit more naturally. I'm not a producer. Maybe what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. But that's kind of what I heard. The vocals are just too forward, too, too empowered, too much in the spotlight compared to the rest of the band. Um... And it's, it's not all the time that I noticed it, but there are certain places, specific syllables, that certainly come through a bit disconnected from the group. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's just me hyper-focusing on the music, because that's what I do in this scenario. But uh, I did notice it more than once. I wanted to bring it up. But otherwise, I think the song does what I believe it set out to do exceptionally well. I'm going to go figure out what that instrument is read some lyrics, and then we'll come back and check out the second track. I couldn't figure out the instrument. Um, I couldn't find the information, personnel list, instrument list, anything like that. I did see on their most recent album, which came out earlier this year, which I think is the follow-up to the album we're checking out right now of, of Brian, what is this? Of Brian and Angel's Beaks, which is where Amy Otoko comes from. Uh, that they have a mandolin on it. That kind of fits. I don't... It might be a mandolin. I think I'm just going to call it that for the sake of conversation if it shows up in uh, Movement 2. But I might be wrong on that. Anyways, lyrically though, this is nothing about freedom. In fact, it's the opposite. It is about being cursed the entire way through the song. It starts off dripping in the silent river, married to a cloud. He's cradling sa sadness as he withers, hopelessly devout. And wherever he goes, he always brings the rain. He's hardly self-aware these days, a ghost of his mistakes sitting on his grave. Vicious mistress, take my curse away. This is pretty much how a majority of the song goes, just wallowing in despair. Having a possibly metaphorical cloud, but maybe a real cloud overhead, making him feel down every day. Eventually, though, he meets a uh, he meets this mistress, the vicious mistress, 
And she says, I'll save your soul, but you have to kill the river sprite. And he says, I can't kill that creature. Is it even worth it to go through with it? But he goes anyways. So in cold blood, I disappear. The hunt, it begins, and the elf is near. He asks the river sprite to forgive him what he will do. And then breaks him. But the cloud remains. The song ends. Vicious mistress, take this curse away. I kept your vow, and yet still the cloud remains. Oh, it rains and rains and rains and rains. Now, if I remember the uh, comment earlier from Mark, this is a concept album going a little bit beyond the idea of an album and is either based on a novel or the band ended up making a novel based on the music. Either way, there's a much larger story at play here. This is just a single story within it. So it, it makes me wonder where the music comes from then. Is the music a feeling of what this person wants out of life? They are down in despair with this curse hanging over them. They would do anything to be free, and the music is the feeling that they want. That raw adventure, sort of a, a musical representation of their inner desires. Because otherwise, I don't really see how the music lines up with the story at all. This is very sad. <laughs> it's it's not great. It's negative. And even at the end, he does something he doesn't want to do and ends up not even getting what he thought he would. It's not a positive song in the least, and yet the music is very bright and vibrant. It's an interesting idea to pair those two together. I'm kind of curious what the purpose of that is. Um, oh yeah, uh, Tabs, give me one second to look at what's going on metrically at the end of the song, and then we'll head into move. Okay, it's uh, not even anything too tricky. <laughs> I'm surprised this got by me, but I'm not perfect. There's some stuff I'm going to get confused over. This is just 4-4. Four, four. In fact, the final... What is this? Uh, bar 130 to the end. Yeah, so the final 14 bars are all in 4-4. Four, four. But what happens here is that the phrase is extended beyond... It sort of has a pickup note to it. Um, in that the 16th note prior to the phrase repeating is where the phrase starts. And it comes in on that note and then gets held over. So actually, what I was feeling as sort of a, a hiccup, a jarring element at the end of the phrase, was intentional, by design. Instead of giving us an emphasized downbeat at beat 1, we get an emphasized attack somewhere between beat 8 and beat 1. Um... It's actually on the uh of eight. Uh, when we subdivide um, beats, we have one E and a, uh, two E and a, uh, where E is the first quarter, uh, and is the halfway point, and a uh is three quarters into it. And that's where we get this uh, the 16th note, is on the uh of eight that introduces the beginning of the next idea and gives us that... Uh, that emphasized attack just a hair before the beat we're expecting it on. So that's what's going on there. Yeah, it's not an odd time signature at all. It's just an interesting phrasing. And again, not even that, that wild. It's just a pickup note. <laughs> um, it just, it, it, it shifts the, uh, the phrasing just enough to sound a bit off. So that's interesting. All right. We are going to... Check out track two now. This one's called Cloudburst. Everything over there I'll update as soon as I hit play. Let's dive into it. Oh, high energy on this. Ooh, very thrashy some power metal working in here. Oh, 
I love the really fast moving guitar underneath the uh, long held out notes. Now that's kind of a poppy catchy melody. Still keeping some of these musical theater chord progressions, but pairing them with more of a metallic sound overall. Those vocal harmonies are a nice touch. A three three two pulse. One two three, one two three, one two, one two three, one two three, one two three. Only coming from the drums though, the guitars were going for more of a static rhythm. Those staccato hits on the vocals, it's so crisp. So good. So good. The dual guitars harmonizing. It's interesting too because the last song basically used zero pedal tones and the guitars are using them a ton in this one. It's a very different feeling from the last movement. This is cool too because this is more atmospherically driven. We didn't have too much of this last time either. Very fluid. <laughs> Those two falsettos tucked in there so good. so many layers in that section and they're almost all moving they're doing something other than just playing chords but they all sort of bleed into the background it's it's wild <laughs> I 
kind of wish that took us somewhere. Continuing to use that rhythm in some capacity. Nice to hear the bass kick continuing on that guitar rhythm from the last section, creating a bit of a rhythmic motif here. The synth coming in under the guitar, fantastic decision. That vibrato, such control. All right, this was interesting. It's a very different style. There's still a little bit of that musical theater in here, but it's uh, it's primarily presented in the vocal work, and again, the melody writing for the vocals. But as far as the drums and guitar are concerned, uh, the bass too. They bring in more of a a metallic edge to this not just in their timbre which we do get more of that gritty guitar that we only got a taste of on movement one but composition too as i mentioned there is a lot of pedal tone usage in this track there's a lot of shred there's a lot of 16th note ideas uh, bringing in some of the faster grittier more in your face components that metal likes to play around with and presenting it as the core compositional body the motif of this song uh, is focusing on a lot of that even when we get to the guitar solo it does end up feeling a bit more uh, restrained at times presenting something that's very tasteful having a bit of shred and pairing it with storytelling but that shred is still there it's still a core aspect of it even the entire beginning of the song at the first two minutes it's power metal it's fast playing uh, production wise it kind of reins it in it, it doesn't feel as aggressive as metal can you know it kind of lightens it up as, as much as I think you can on the production side um, but it's it's a very metallic beginning it's jumping very far away from um, the overall sonic palette of movement one so I think that's a that's a very interesting decision now granted for those who aren't aware of this they are not played back to back on the album. Movement 1 is track 3 and Movement 2 is track 12. It's actually the album closer. So there could be a lot of music in between these that helps uh, kind of create a flow so that it's not as jarring because moving from Movement 1 to Movement 2 is a very jarring change. <laughs> Um, and I think if I just played them back to back, I would have had a lot of questions, especially if I didn't know that they were separated on the album. Uh, but yeah, that, I mean, that's very surface level though. Very drastic change. You notice it right off the bat. Um, but like I said, one thing that doesn't change much is the vocal melodies. I still love these. They're wonderful, they're gorgeous, uh, the dexterity in the vocals, the performative side, the, the chops that are required to do some of this stuff. Um, dang, I mean, dude, those falsettos at the end, uh, that moment in the bridge, sneaking in those two falsettos in the middle of the melody, like, come on, dude, seriously? So freaking good, man. Um, 
but it it continues to retain some of that musical theater element it it doesn't go for the easy memorable melody lines it goes for stuff that's a bit more uh requires more skill to pull off isn't much of an earworm because there's more to it it isn't a simple melodic idea um, it's more engaged more involved more complex and uh, i love that you know it, this is definitely an element that i think reminds me a lot of of haken i kind of brought this up earlier i talked about the production uh haken tends to go for a, a hyper sterile very spacious sound as well but uh it didn't really click with me until right now that the Haken vocalist also, you know, sometimes they will engage with simpler, earwormier kind of things, uh, simpler both in dexterity and jumps, but also simpler um, as far as notes are concerned. Sometimes sitting around, you know, single notes, just kind of keeping things uh, simple from a pitch perspective. Minimal might be a way to, to view that, but they also love their very dexterous jumping around doing all sorts of wild uh, leaps and, and note choices stuff that's just not very mainstream and uh, makes it less memorable as far as uh, catchiness goes but more memorable in the way that there's just not much out out there that's like it at least in the realm of rock and the Azure vocalist here, I mean, once again, like I said, leaning into that musical theater elements of uh, these big belting moments, lots of micro contrast and dynamics within the vocal delivery, all the different uh, timbres, the styles of delivery, um, the placement of the voice. There's a lot of changes that go on in the coloring of the vocals that that mixed with all of the wide uh, the wide palette of pitches that they, they work with creates something very unique, very entertaining to listen to. Not something that's going to get stuck in my ear. Not earworm material. Uh, you know, this is not poker face, just choosing one single <laughs> one single note. Pa, 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 poker face, pa, pa. I mean, that's simple. That's why it's catchy. That's why it gets stuck in your mind. Uh, sorry if I've just got that stuck in anyone else's mind, although I don't think my rendition is that great. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I do love that song anyways this is the opposite this is memorable because it's complex because it's different but it's not something that's going to get stuck in my ear uh, but yeah I, I do like the pairing here the musical theater element with more of the power metal writing and the other side of that is just a general speed there's an intensity to this song that we kind of didn't get last time. The intensity from uh, Movement 1 kind of came from the atmospheric element, from the harmony of it. It was very wide and adventurous and carefree and open, and that just makes you want to engage with that. And the song continues on because it has this bright positive energy to it. This song continues on because the guitarists have no idea how to slow down. <laughs> I say that uh, lovingly and, and jokingly. Um, there's just so much fast playing to this, whether it is the opening riff or the guitar solo. It's interesting that not much else keeps up with that, though. Normally when we have power metal like this, it kind of brings in a, a thrashier, speedier side to the playing. The drums are also going to keep up with that. We didn't really get that here. The drums continue to play with their more laid-back approach to just keeping a central time and pulse. I thought that was an interesting combination. It allows the song to get that extra energy without feeling dominated by it. The drums allow the song to kind of be reined in a little bit, and while we do have this forward momentum, it does not feel out of control. I think that combination works really well and keeps the song grounded in a way. Which is interesting because Movement 1 didn't really feel grounded at all. Very much taking flight and enjoying it, really leaning into that open-ended element. And this one doesn't. This one feels heavier because of it. It feels more grounded and rooted. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes down to the balance of energy on this one. Understanding you know, what you're wanting to, to create in these songs and really leaning into that and understanding where the balance needs to be in order to create all these different vibes. Uh, the ending to this song, though, I mean, just dang, this is a big 
ending. We even have a little bit of a, uh, a retardando there at the end to slow things down and make it feel weightier and larger and more impactful. The vocalist is hitting some wild notes. There's a really strong moment of resolution there at the end. It's just, it's, it's good. It kind of flops this, flips the song upside down, goes away from that fast driving energy to something powerful and impactful and present. Great stuff. The other thing I want to bring up, and I kind of forgot to bring it up about Movement 1, is just layers in general. This one I think certainly leans more into it, especially in the bridge, when the guitars finally decide to slow down a little bit and focus more on chordal information, although they weren't just playing chords. There was still movement to their riffs, but it was focused on usually just a handful of notes in order to craft a specific atmosphere with this concept of almost twinkling on the outsides. We had these vocal layers coming in, adding in this extra harmonic information. It was just a really gorgeous part. Um, and really, if you just listen to it, I think it's really easy to key into just the drums and the vocals. They're what's most present in that moment. But if you, if you just let your attention drift to either side, you're going to find so many layers of little moving, articulate, ornamental ideas that really fills this out. And I think removing any of them would have made the section feel a little underwhelming. Um, and I, I love how everything came together that to just really lean into something atmospheric, which is something we didn't really get too much of on Movement 1. So... Yeah, this was just a fantastic way to, to wrap this up and a cool, you know, other side of the coin to uh, to the first track we checked out. I'm going to have to listen to more of Azure, I think. I dug both of these tracks. I think I've listened to another one from them, though. I think Mark also recommended that song, too. I think that was during a live stream, though. Um, but they also had a new album come out earlier this year, which I know I said just a little bit ago. It's called Fim. And it came out in May. Okay, that's earlier than I thought. I thought it was a little more recent. But yeah, it came out in May of this year. Very cool stuff. Let me read some lyrics to this track. And then we're going to uh, wrap this video up. So I, I didn't expect to fully understand what's going on here. Not only is this the end of an album. But I also think all the albums are connected. I might be a little wrong in that... Regardless, there's probably a lot of story that happened in the last, I don't know, like eight tracks. <laughs> but this is a continuation of uh, the narrative. The character we were following says, uh, How can I have gone so wrong? In an act of passion, I have found myself deceived. There's innocent blood on my face. The rain has stopped, so nothing will wash it away. My mistress will pay. So... He's finally done something that's pushed him, pushed him over the edge. He he uh, finally followed a request that has just completely broke him, um, and maybe there is literal blood on his face. Maybe it's metaphorical, but now more than ever, he could really use the rain that's been following him, and it has stopped. So, from a figurative point of view, he can't forget what he's done now. There's no way of washing it away. The chorus says that I can sever cloud from, from bone, and still I am never free. The rain is gone, but like a ghost, the cloud still follows me. So, he, he'll never forget his past sins. Everything he's done will continue to follow him. He'll have that visual reminder, the cloud. Um, kind of follows on with this uh, wallowing of guilt that he has. He, he's a very emotional, dramatic person. He likes to wear his emotions on his sleeve. Two songs here and both verses have been primarily repetition of themselves in order to really drive home his emotional state. Um, but we get to the bridge and there's some conversation about the world at large. I'm not sure how much of this I need to know about. He brings up the Watchers. Um, and dark slumbers on a beach. Um, he says that he starts a fire though, and here's a familiar calling. It says, I am the sea, and it was her all along. Uh, it says, I'm the reason for her incarnation. 
when I returned with that cursed condensation. I really like that. The rhyme there, incarnation to condensation, but also the alliteration of cursed condensation, that all that works really well. Um, he says, now that the river sprite is dead, we await the storm. How many acolytes have shown the one she bred for war? Let it rain again. Here becomes... Here begins the age of men, the nameless wanderer cried. The cloudburst breaks, the gods will fade in fear of wind and tide. So again, there's probably some lore and story stuff to this that it probably makes more sense when you know what's going on. I skipped right to the end and I'm complaining that I got lost. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't have much to add to this. Um... I find that this song is very dreary too, though. And musically, while there is more antagonism to the music, more negative elements to it, it is still generally very fast-paced, energetic song. Although, however, I think I could probably read it as burning rage and anger, which I think is what this song is really about. There is the, oh, geez, what have I done kind of downtrodden feeling to it, but there's also this anger, this animosity towards the person who has led them to do these acts they're putting the blame on someone else and sort of want revenge or at least that's kind of the feeling i'm getting out of it so while i do i was kind of expecting a little bit more uh i don't know weightier music to be in the in the song i think having the driving energy does fit with my very surface level understanding of what's going on here and that might not, it not that might not even be a really strong understanding of what's going on here as i just said i've skipped to the final chapter i'm a bit lost <laughs> so i'm just going to wrap this up those are my thoughts on uh, azure's amiotoko one and two what did you think of this music? Is there anything that stood out to you? Anything that you liked that you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on? Maybe you just have a different opinion or perspective on it. Put all that stuff down in the comments section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for this one. I'll be back tomorrow, though, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC as usual. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.